Now, the introduction begins with the, uh, with the words von Ringen die Erstlehr, the first lesson of wrestling. And the author gives us three qualities, uh, Stärk, Maß und Pentigkeit, um, which he then defines and uh, gives uses for. And I did not include a translation here. Um, you might have to either buy the companion uh, book, which will make Michael happy, or uh, you can just wait until it uh, appears on Wichtenauer. I haven't checked, maybe it's already on there. Um, anyway, if we look at these definitions, we realize that some of these terms uh, to quote the Princess Bride, don't mean what you think they mean. Um, so first he says that Stärk, which would literally translate as strength, uh, should be used to go in your balanced stance and maintain it. And mass which would translate as measure, um, basically is the proper use of the hand and feet. Therefore, in modern words, it would mean coordination. And pentikite, or which would literally translate as agility, um, means that you can read your opponent and that you always well remember the techniques that you have learned and that you know how to counter. So basically it would mean uh, that uh, you have uh, automatized knowledge of wrestling. I should mention that uh, all of this introduction is basically a commented version uh, of uh, Ott, uh, even though the author does not mention Mr. Ott, uh, he does not seem to regard that as relevant uh, information. Um, but there are some key differences. Um, also in the terminology, because um, First of all, Ot starts with Kunst, which would be analogous to Pentikite in Wallstein or Baumann's Fechbuch. Then instead of Maas, Ot uses the term Snelligkeit or Speed. And uh, the only identical term is Strength. Now, Ott also mentions that uh, uh, speed is the best attribute for a wrestler because it prevents any attempts to counter your technique, which is something that uh, modern wrestling coaches probably would agree with. Even though Ott and uh, Baumann's Fechbuch use the same, same term Stärk, it is not entirely clear whether Ott actually had the same idea about strength as Baumann's Fechbuch. If we look at modern wrestling in comparison, then um, we find a lot of things in common. For example, the one thing that tends to tire out people the most is actually maintaining a proper stance. Now, there is different ways you can stand in modern wrestling. Uh, in Greco, you will stand more upright, which is closer to what you see in the treatises. In freestyle, you stand uh, bent over, sometimes even way more bent over than this guy here. This is a fairly moderate stance, you can stand so much bent over that your torso actually touches your upper thighs and still be in a good position to wrestle. 
Um, but uh, in all cases, we see that the knees are bent and maintaining your stance is one of the key focus points of wrestling conditioning. Now, there are also other ways that uh, you can uh, use strength in wrestling. Um, however, once again, not maybe not necessarily the way that you would expect. For example, when people think of wrestling, they usually think of lifting. However, you um, all the situations in wrestling where you have to lift your opponent, you lift him by choice, and therefore it means you can go through your entire international wrestling career just fine without ever lifting an opponent off the mat in competition. However, what you do have to do is you have to hang on to him, and that is like uh, make him carry your weight, use your weight to bring him down. And that is actually something that the introduction mentions later on. Um, the aspect of coordination was uh, summed up by uh, Pasquale Passarelli, uh, famous uh, Greco wrestler out of Nuremberg. And he said, a good wrestler needs to be a good gymnast. And um, I don't know a single wrestler who would uh, disagree with this statement. The better your coordination is, the more technical and tactical options you have on the mat. And uh, finally, on the term of automatized, with an emphasis on that, knowledge, um, I have a quote by boxer Jack Dempsey, who said, all the time he's boxing, he's thinking, all the time he was thinking, I was hitting him. And what uh, Mr. Dempsey so eloquently phrased uh, basically is that as long as you have to think about what technique to apply, you are always going to be slower than somebody with the same physical attributes who does not have to think. And therefore, what you need to strive for in your career as a fighter is uh, to not think, which is very zen and... Um, probably not entirely what uh, Mr. Dempsey had in mind. Uh, however, it gives you a very, very distinct advantage when it comes to fighting. Now, um, Mr. Passarelli was a very interesting character. Uh, he uh, had some connections to organized crime and uh, he's currently doing time for trying to sell 15 kilos of weed um, and that should also give you an idea that um, uh, while there are rules in competition that does not necessarily mean that the rules are always observed but more on that later now on with the introduction of part B. So um, the author tells us that whenever you are wrestling somebody who is weaker and or smaller than you, he chooses the word uh, uh, kranken, which basically would translate as sicker, uh, and which is an interesting choice of words. Uh, uh, in any case, uh, with this opponent, you should wrestle focusing on your strength. Uh, if somebody is your equal, then you should focus on measure. And uh, if somebody is stronger and or bigger than you, then you should wrestle with uh, your um, skill, basically. And then he expands on that. So if you are wrestling somebody who is uh, smaller or weaker, you should maintain your stance. Uh, you should not be afraid of him, and basically you should just go through him. We have examples for that in modern wrestling competition as well, like uh, Mr. Alexander Karelin, who probably never had 
to face an opponent who was his physical equal in his entire career. Then if you are wrestling somebody who is your equal, you should uh, most of all focus on position. You should prevent your opponent from gaining a superior position on you because in that case, even though he is not bigger or stronger, you will be in serious trouble. Uh, examples of that would include him bringing you down and or taking you back. As an example here, I have chosen uh, renowned wrestling genius Buvai Sarsaitiev, who was a real master at uh, bringing his opponents into these uncomfortable positions. And uh, it also says here that uh, you need to wear him down and always, it literally translates as sit on him, but uh, I think a better translation would be to hang on him heavily. So finally, if you're wrestling somebody who is bigger and stronger than you, um, you should uh, watch out for his attacks. And you should stay in a low stance and you should break his grip which is something that my wrestling coaches also emphasized. You should not, um, in their words, hang together with somebody who is bigger and stronger than you because uh, you don't stand much of a chance in such cases. And you should go backwards and see whether you can um, seduce him, uh, is the wording that he chooses, with your art or and um, uh, rush him, especially uh, seizing one of his feet or getting under him to throw him. And you will find examples for that later on. So I have a little video here, let's see if it works, where we can see a wrestler uh, employing uh, agility to get out of a bad situation. So let's see it again. So this is basically backflip out of an outside single leg. And surprisingly enough, uh, it hit the scene in 2013 and uh, less than one year later you could see uh, wrestlers all over the place doing it. Of course, it is a rather risky maneuver because the counter is kind of obvious, like if the wrestler in red were to sprawl in the, at the right moment, um, the guy in blue would uh, land on the back of his head. And uh, there is also versions of this technique which I think are actually superior, where instead of flipping backwards, he is flipping to the side, but that is not um, all that easy to do from here. In any case, a very impressive display of agility. Now, um, Ott basically says the same thing uh, in much fewer words, and uh, the way Ott puts it probably would be sufficient if you had trained under him. You would remember the other things that he said about the applications. But um, Baumann's Fechbuch is much easier to understand if you're not from that school. Uh, there's an interesting difference in the wording of the last part. And that is where um, Baumann's Fechbuch says Fuß, which means foot. Ott specifically says the crook of the knee. And um, they both work, but... Um, in my opinion, if you are fighting a big guy, uh, it's actually better to attack the knee than it is to attack the foot because um, it uh, puts you in a less uh, unstable position. <laughs>
Now let's change to the laser pointer again. And then um, our author does something interesting. He chooses to go beyond odd uh, in a number of ways. And he says that uh, even a smaller or weak, weaker wrestler uh, can defeat a strong one in a real fight if he has uh, art and measure and if he knows the right uh, dangerous techniques, the Kampfstück and the Mordstück. And he gives you a number of these Kampfstück and Mordstück, as we can see below. Um, it's also interesting to point out that uh, unlike section C, section B is actually appears to be uh, geared towards unarmed fighting for the most part like uh, uh, you will not do all that much damage with these techniques if your opponent is in armor which means that it was clearly written for different audience in the different context and then he goes uh, in a real wrestling contest uh, like a sportive wrestling contest the strong one will always have an advantage and uh, then the final sentence is actually uh, a little bit debatable um, but the art is praised by knights and um, uh, Knechten in this context could either mean servants or it could also mean men at arms uh, für alle Dinge, um, above everything else. So um, this could be an implicit critique of sportive wrestling, but uh, again, uh, it is not entirely clear whether that is intended that way. However, I should also make the point that um, while it is often said that there is a large difference between real fighting and combat sports. Um, I think that statement is often taken a little bit out of context because we take our combat sport very, very seriously. And um, as Mr. Passarelli here shows, we do not always stick to the rules and there is entire books written on the noble science of cheating your way through a contest. And uh, truth be told, I have seen most of, if not all, of the Kampfstück and Mordstück in uh, Mr. Wallerstein's book in competition and very rarely did the referee intervene because people are coached to commit fouls in a way that are invisible to the ref. I have expanded on this point a little bit in the article. Um, I will maybe make a few more remarks in that regard later. But first, let us look what um, the author might uh, have had in mind when he was talking about sportive wrestling in his time. And the most extensive source we have on this subject is Pietro Monte, who is of Spanish and or Italian descent. And in any case, he um, uh, wrote a book covering all kinds of physical activities in his time and uh, he was also a very successful condottiere um, like he was leading uh, soldiers and mercenaries in various battles in northern Italy in the late 15th century and um, he gives us a rule set of wrestling which he thinks is better than everything else 
and uh, that is the rule set of the style that he has apparently trained in for the most part. There is also an interesting thing like most uh, uh, wrestlers and or grapplers will tell you that their um, own rule set is the best one to rule them all. Uh, however, in uh, my point of view, there are things to be said about each and every one of them and in their favor. So let us look at Montes gold standard the Spanish Sicilian wrestling rules. You should wrestle for two falls, which means it's the best out of three. Whoever first uh, gains two falls is going to win, and the fall is touching the floor with anything other than the feet. If both wrestlers fall, the one executing the technique is going to get the score unless he lands in a much worse position, for example, under the opponent. If uh, someone trips over his own feet, it doesn't count as a fall. If he falls in a specific way, if he basically squats down, um, you can grip your opponent freely with the exception of the genitals, the mouth, the nose, the eyes, the hair and the throat. However, I think it's not too much of a stretch to assume that even in Montes time, uh, not all wrestlers always stuck to the rules. But gripping the legs is forbidden. Um, you are allowed to sweep them with your own feet and legs, but you're not supposed to grip them with the hands. And Monte says that, that is because that is how it is on the battlefield. Um, in another section of his book, he elaborates that during a duel, it is actually advantageous to grip the opponent's legs. However, he does not uh, tell you how to do that. He seems to think it's self-explanatory. On the other hand, most of the German sources seem to be written for dueling context, uh, context and uh, that uh, shapes their wrestling to a large degree. You should wrestle in normal clothing, it should be neither tight nor loose. Um, the pants and the double should not be tied together. But unfortunately for Mr. Monte, there is also uh, a number of second tier rule sets that he goes on and rants about. Um, but curiously enough, he is still our most extensive source also on those. So let us have a look at them. So freestyle wrestling, anything where you grip the opponent's legs, and or continue on the ground, as they do in Germany, Hungary, Bohemia and Poland, is very much unlike arm fighting, again, with an emphasis on the battlefield situation. Um, there are some regions where only back falls count and um, ground contact is permitted otherwise. For example, in Britain, France and some regions of Italy um, and Monte says that it's basically self-defeat, uh, it's only good for drunkards, uh, he makes various comparisons with houses, trees, statues, etc., um, of which you would say that they have fallen over regardless um, in which direction they fall. Um, in Portugal there appears to have been one rule set where you could touch the ground with the hands and knees if you were attacking, Monte thinks this only leads to discussions. There are belt wrestling styles, especially in northern Italy, and Monte thinks that these only emphasize strength, no technique, and they probably do that because their butts are so fat. Uh, interestingly enough, there is still a belt wrestling style in Switzerland today, it is Schwingen. And um, while, of course, Monte's remarks are a little bit over the top, it is true that in belt wrestling, if you wrestle in this 
type of fashion as they do in Schwingen, uh, unlike uh, Klima in Iceland, etc. Um, strength and size really are very important factors. Um, you can compensate for some disadvantages in strength and size, however, um, you would want both to be reasonably close to your opponent's uh, uh, qualities in this uh, regard. And uh, if you look at the top shringers in Switzerland, very, very few of them weigh less than 110 kilos. Um, in Greece, they uh, wrestle until the opponent has to be stretched out on the floor. Monte does not think that this even merits a uh, comment. And uh, in Britain, they supposedly wrestled with linen cloths around the neck. And Monte says that half the time people fall over because they are choked out rather than thrown. So, to recap, our friend Monte basically suggests a rule set which is reasonably close to what we see, for example, in sumo or in Mongolian book. So um, basically anything uh, other than the feet touching the ground means instant defeat. Um, in contrast to sumo, what they apparently don't seem to have had is a ring and the push-out rule, so you win if you force your opponent to leave the fighting ground. And uh, there's also apparently people who wrestled naked. Monte does not tell us where they did that. Maybe he doesn't want to attract the wrong crowd or whatever. And uh, Monte says that this is clearly indecent and definitely not tactical because you are not going to go onto the battlefield naked unless uh, you are an ancient Celt or something like that, maybe. As you are probably aware of, there are uh, modern competitions that uh, call themselves uh, historical or medieval wrestling. Uh, the most famous one probably being swordfish wrestling, swordfish ringen. Um, I have copied you the rules here. And interesting enough, they don't match any of the rule sets that Monte describes. And uh, as a result, um, you can usually very clearly see uh, the grappling background of the competitors. Uh, in the case of T. School, for example, you will see that he uh, used to be a judoka. And um, while I love all types of grappling competitions, I do think that uh, since we have such a great uh, and detailed rule set from Monte, maybe it would be time to uh, start the Monte Cup or something. You heard it here first. Okay, enough of that. Let us look at the didactic structure of part B. And as Mr. Welle has already pointed out, it is remarkably well structured for a wrestling treaties of the time. Um, there is a number of situations, and uh, for each situation, he uh, the author lists the lists appropriate techniques that can be done from there. So, um, Mr. Mont, uh, Mr. Vele has suggested uh, various groups here, which you can see numbered uh, from A to K. And uh, for the article, I have first tried to translate uh, Vele's German terminology into English. Um, I agree with uh, Welle for the most part, as I seem to do very often. Um, I have a few small remarks which might be interesting to you. Uh, 
um, for example, it seems that um, when it comes to wrestling with the clothes, all our author is telling us both times that this uh, uh, comes up how to counter these grips. Um, with uh, section F, I'm not entirely sure whether really an over under tie up is intended. I think neither the description nor the depiction are entirely clear. But the wording um, is very similar to uh, another folio, and in that case, it seems to mean an underarm bear hug rather than an over under. But um, that is of little importance here. Um, however, I think that um, it might be appropriate to uh, rearrange the groups J and K slightly. I think. Um, all of these folios could be summed up as brawling and the last ones um, are not really uh, brawling but they are more uh, intended the handling of prisoners in various contexts. And in addition, if you wanted, um, you could group the groups A and B together as wrestling from neutral positions, which means that both opponents have the same possibilities. And uh, then we have a fairly long section um, which could have the overarching title of countering advantageous tie-ups from your opponent. Um, so basically what to do if your opponent gains a better position than yourself. If we look at the uh, didactic sequence and the grouping of techniques in modern grappling sports of course first we have to have a look at judo where there is various systems in place so um, in judo you have the basic um, sets of techniques which is called the gokyo the, this is the original one from uh, 1895. It has since been expanded. It's, it includes more throws. Um, but what we have here basically is a didactic sequence where you are supposed to first learn the first group, then the second, then the third, the fourth, and finally the fifth. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, the techniques become increasingly difficult and uh, also more numerous. So um, the Gokyo basically gives you a sequence in which the techniques are supposed to be learned rather than uh, grouping them according to situations or execution. This has changed in some of the newer books um, which will uh, group techniques in different manners, like uh, first of all, you can uh, uh, group the nagiwaza or throws into standing throws and sacrifice throws. And then, as you can see here, you can group them into hand techniques, hip techniques, leg techniques, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, as I have mentioned in the first video. Um, uh, judo is a little bit special in this regard, um, but uh, in favor of their grouping I can quote a friend of mine who is a high-level judoka and uh, he says that in his opinion these groupings can actually help you when learning to throw uh, because uh, the way they are grouped should uh, tell you about uh, the working body parts and principles to a very large degree. What we also see here in part one um, is that uh, first in these books you normally learn about uh, your stance, uh, about the grips, 
about the phases of the throw, the breaking of the balance or disturbing the balance of your opponent, how to move on the mat, how to fall properly, etc. Now, if we look at Sambo, which is a, a Russian version of Judo with uh, some elements of uh, uh, Soviet folk wrestling styles mixed in, um, basically it's uh, fairly similar to what we just saw in the last uh, Judo book. Um, basically similar throws or variations of throws working according to the same principle are grouped together. I'm sorry, I just had this um, uh, German uh, book here, but uh, if you want you can verify it uh, with uh, the various uh, books in English language. Um, although, of course, not every book is going to use the same type of grouping. They all use whatever didactic, stru didactic structure seems appropriate to them. Here we have another German example from uh, wrestling. This one is an old East German handbook, um, which is uh, geared towards young wrestlers. And um, it has just a handful of techniques, uh, but it starts out with a very, very extensive section on movement and drills in order to then be able to learn better and faster. Um, and uh, if you look at the various throws, for example, the Greco ones here, you can see that they progress from very simple ones to more difficult ones, which again is similar to the principle that the uh, uh, Gokyo in Judo was arranged. Um, this is a more recent publication from uh, the German Wrestling Association. And um, as you can see here, they have grouped the techniques according to the age at which they should be learned, like for young wrestlers aged 7 to 10 and so on and so forth. Of course, this is going to be specific to the um, various countries. For example, my coach told me that in Russia, um, kids usually don't learn wrestling before the age of 12. Uh, they first get... Uh, uh, basic gymnastic education and then the kids are selected um, according to their talents in which sports they can and will go. But um, back to this one, so uh, again the difficulty of the throws and techniques is going to progress as the kids age. Um, this is an American publication. Uh, I think you can still get, in, get it. Uh, it's uh, titled uh, Winning Wrestling Moves. It's one of the standard uh, works on the subject in the English language. And um, this one is interesting because it uses basically a double system. First, uh, it uh, does teach you variations of one technique, but um, then it uh, goes into um, how to react in various situations. Like if you take him down to the mat, how you can finish, um, how you are supposed to wrestle from a certain tie up and so on and so forth. And this system is actually remarkably close to the one that Baumann's Facebook uses. So if we then look a little bit at the development of uh, the use of text and pictures in these instructional media. Um, here we have an example from 1960, but uh, it's also fairly typical for the older uh, publications. And uh, that is, we usually just have one single picture um, chosen according to what the author thought was the most important phase of the throw. And then the action is broken down into various 
phases which are then described more or less extensively and then uh, it also lists uh, variations it lists defense it lists counters and uh, it lists potential follow-ups of these techniques now the um, as you probably imagine one picture isn't very much to show uh, you an entire motion and so there were various attempts to go beyond that. Personally, I rather like the East German and Soviet style publication because they have chosen to use line drawings, which are often more clear than bad photos, as you can see in some of the old Judah books, like two guys in white pants and white jackets. So it can be a little bit hard to figure out what, what body part belongs to whom. Um, so here you have line drawings, uh, the uh, one wrestler is in red, one wrestler is in black, which interestingly enough, uh, to some degree is also true for Wallerstein part B, where you can usually find the attacking wrestler in red. And um, then all the phases that the movement is broken down into are both described and have a corresponding picture, but uh, the really great thing is uh, the arrows here which indicate the direction of movement. So, so if you're a little bit familiar with this type of depiction, you can really see and ideally even feel the motion. <coughs> here we have an even more extreme example from the same school of thought. Um, they have chosen to forego the description entirely and just focus on more pictures, more arrows. Um, and uh, conveniently, they have also included training drills, which you can do in order to develop the attributes necessary for this technique. I highly recommend this publication if you can find it. And... Um, this one also includes common mistakes, like um, things that uh, the authors do not want you to do. Interestingly enough, most of these things are still done today with full intent in international wrestling, but uh, they are considered to be advanced variations and not fit for beginners. Um, the most modern version of the use of pictures and um, description maybe is found in uh, the publication mentioned before by the German Wrestling Federation. They have chosen to break the movement down into um, four phases which are described and eight phases which are depicted here. And in addition, you also get a QR code up here, which you can scan and then watch the video of um, this specific clip in case uh, you still have any questions. It is a very good system. I uh, definitely have to give them that. Personally, I still think you can achieve the same goal with line drawings and arrows, but maybe that is just me. In the back of the book you can also find all of the QR codes for all the techniques um, on a few pages, which is maybe the fastest way to get an overview over which techniques are taught first, like the simple ones, and then finally you get the more difficult ones. Uh, or also to go through all of the techniques quickly if you don't like reading or something. So to sum up, basically the development has been from a most uh, in the 19th and 20th century um, from a single depiction and a sometimes a very sizable amount of text to rather less text, but more pictures 
and uh, in some time, sometimes even video.